I think all of the videos that I've done have brought us to the point where we're arriving at this shore together, where essentially I'm going to ask and try to answer a question. That question is, why are people not encountering God anymore? It is the single greatest besetting blow to the body of Christ now, and I've mentioned it several times already on this channel. Undoubtedly, you've seen me say this many times, that you cannot find or you cannot encounter the Lord in the vast majority of church services today. And I, I've expressed this by saying basically that there is not an institutional property whereby you could go and seek and find. I couldn't give any prescription where I could say if you go to this congregation or if you exclusively attend this denomination or basically I cannot give you a prescription for how you would find Christ, right? But it is very true that people were more connected to God than they are today and that those connections were so rich those connections were so rich and they were so meaningful that people even died for their faith in Christ, which seems so far from where we are today. To be honest with you, most of what people believe about God or the Bible is very manipulated by what the culture is um, proposing at that time. And to our great downfall, because there, the, we've lost that rich history, I feel like the thing that is uh, missing it's the missing component from the discussion that we talked about last time that within this history that we all have is also a a history of how God interacted, right? So you have this verse in Hebrews where it says God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, right? Like so in a bunch of different times and in a bunch of different ways, okay? Like God was always interacting with mankind and you find this by how these truths are propagated throughout all of the world and everyone's recognizing the same ideal. It's why I tried to essentially tie it back to ethics, the idea that there is this law that is written upon our hearts that even though, even though we may not have had access or our ancestors especially did not have access to the truths of God's word, yet they did have access to the truths that are in God's word, meaning that those truths live outside of the Bible as well and that the Bible should be seen as a library of information to provide insight upon the truths that are known and self-actualized to each and every man, okay? Man mankind knows that it is wrong to kill and to murder other men. That has to be taught out of them or culturally presupposed in order to be accomplished. But it drives at several different questions. Okay, so if God has and is making himself relevant through these archetypal narratives and through this archetypal pattern that can display itself not only in the world, but also through multi-layers, like we've talked about before, you're having something that's been displayed to you individually, like you might understand individually the idea of the escape from tyranny, right, that's laid out in Exodus. In Individually, you understand that when the, the Israelites left Egypt, they left Egypt, the greatest tyranny that they would ever face and their greatest um, conflict with tyranny would come the moment that they begin to depart from Egypt. Pharaoh mounts his army and he begins to pursue them and he's going to kill them. And then there's a great act of faith that delivers them once again from their fiercest conflict with tyranny. Okay. And that great act of faith was the crossing of the Red Sea. There was something rather miraculous in that. Okay, so then you see that this plays itself out throughout world history as well. I'm going to use the United States escaping from England, right? They're escaping the tyranny of England. Well, what happens? It's their greatest moments of conflict. You don't, you're not far removed from us finally having won the Revolutionary War. England's coming over here and they're burning down the White House. Not long after that, we have this great moment of conflict within our nation known as a civil war where you have the country divided against itself and killing itself and in many ways you do not have the united states of america until we have conquered one another and we are no longer the divided states of america right so you have a unification that occurs through great conflict and the escape from tyranny plays again itself on a global or a national level on that 
that stance. So you can see this embodied throughout the world and how that pattern will replay itself. You can also understand it through your own individual aspect of deliverance from uh, tyranny within your own life. So you escape the consequence of sin unto salvation in God, right? You escape that thing through faith in Jesus Christ. No sooner, I bet no sooner have you escaped the tyranny of uh, the consequences of sin, no sooner have you escaped from these things then you find that you are having the greatest conflict you've ever felt within your heart and you're fighting your greatest battles that you have ever fought, probably because for the first time in your life you're trying to be righteous. So now you are warring against the unrighteousness that embodies who you are as a person because all of your experiences up to that point were in unrighteousness. And Paul asks this question in the book of Romans. He says, what happened to the deeds that you did when you were unrighteous? What do, what do they seem to you as now? He, said, he says that they're dead to you, are they not? Well, then if they're dead to you, then allow the works of God to be alive unto you. So that's kind of where we land today. I, I said that you cannot abandon, you cannot have the God of Christianity without the morality of Christianity, but we have abandoned the morality of Christianity. And why have we abandoned the morality of Christianity? Because we detached behavior from Christianity. We detached what being a Christian was. But when James talks about being religious, he says he says there's a pure religion undefiled, and that's to care for the fatherless, meaning orphans, right, and the widows, okay? So your, your greatest act of religious fervor is not a belief, but it is in fact an action. The fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to showcase that you have the fruit of the Spirit of God, okay? Here's how, God, here's how Paul lays out what the fruit of the Spirit is. Oh, I bet it's believing in the Trinity. Well, no, actually, it's goodness and mercy and kindness and love, right? It's long-suffering and gentleness and patience and meekness. All of a sudden, it becomes things, it becomes this embodiment of the thing that you believe, not what it is that you believe. There's an ethic that, that lies above the idea. And the reason why I'm saying this is, is that ideas come and go, right? How God interacts with man and what is true while God is interacting with man, that, that changes from time to time. God interacts with, uh, with Samson's father by uh, appearing unto him, uh, have an angel appear unto him, and then having that angel depart by jumping into a fire. Uh, he's not going to interact with anyone else that way. That's just that one guy and I guess his wife one time in scripture that we see that, right? Okay, what does Ezekiel see? Well, Ezekiel sees rings full of eyes and all this other crazy visions that honestly that I don't think I've seen an accurate drawing of it or that you could really understand. It doesn't make sense. If that is what he saw, it is the most senseless thing. You know, it was like almost like a surreal painting. It doesn't it doesn't visually have any connection to what we could understand as something that is a real creature, okay? Well, what what about John? Well, John sees visions of heaven as well, but John also has all of these different experiences than all of the other apostles. The gospel of John is so uniquely different, they call it the non-synoptic gospel, right? It's also the only gospel that was written with the entire revelation of God, in purview. So it is a different gospel from that standpoint. Well, what about the synoptic gospels? Well, they're all different. They're not even the same. You have parallels, but when, when people want to talk about the New Testament and they want to try to understand it, they'll, they'll try to give it this um, almost like an evolutionary history. They're like, well, this book was written, and then this book is you know 50% of that book and 90% of this book. And th the truth of the matter is, is what you really have is you have each man's unique novel interaction with the Lord while they were on this earth and the Holy Spirit using those people to, to communicate through all of time and history the truths that they understood that no one else understood about the times that they were interacting with Christ on earth. Now, if I say that, I'm saying that, think, think about what the book of Genesis really is then. The book of Genesis is not just telling you historical stories. The book of Genesis is actually giving you historical no narratives that have an endless meaning. They, they, they are so rich and so deep that they live beyond the story that they tell in and of themselves, and they actually resonate to deeper truths that would be true across all of time and history. Now, that's a great thing to grapple with, but it is also 
part of the thing that must be understood by calling the Bible the Word of God. If the Bible are, is the words of God, if that's what it legitimately is, this is a universal authorship of God by different human vessels, not a collection, not just a library of a collection of sacred text that we have deemed worthy to be remembered, but it is actually what it says it is, the very words of God. If that statement is true, then it must be viewed through the lens of an eternal, universal narrative. And when I say universal, I mean it in the same way when we say omniscient or uh, omnipotent with God. Like, just because God does know all things, or just because God has all power, does not mean that everything that happens in life is the ordination of God. Um you know, me pushing over a lamp and it falling on the floor. That wasn't predetermined before the world began that that should happen. Um, and that was not the hand of God that pushed the table over the lamp over onto the floor. Uh, same way that when I'm saying universal, I don't mean that every passage applies to every person in every situation. I mean that it is an embodying truth that showcases the same truth to all mankind through its narrative. So back to our fundamental question, why don't we have encounters with God? Uh, basically, the easiest way I can lay this out to you is this. There must be, now I know this seems like a leap, and we'll get to it, I promise. I will answer, I will answer the leap that I'm about to make. There must be unjust suffering in the world. The reason that there must be unjust suffering in the world is because the Bible tells us that there is unjust suffering in the world and that you can suffer wrongfully and you can suffer justfully, right? You you can go through suffering and you're it's it's not predetermined or ordained or anything else. It's just you are enduring the suffering that is in this world. Also, you can endure suffering that you deserve. You can easily endure suffering that you deserve. So why don't people have encounters with God? I think the easiest way I can lay this out is, the Bible says that the inspiration of the Almighty is within all of mankind. So the inspiration is there. It also says this in the New Testament. He is given to each man, I think every man, he is given to every man a measure of faith. So every man has a measure of faith, and every man has the inspiration of the Almighty. It also says this, that the spirit of man the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Speaking of what? Speaking of our conscience. Okay, so that's the ethic. That's the ethic that all mankind feels within his chest. That's the ethic that all men experience. That's the truth that God communicates to all men without the truth or the light of Scripture coming into play at all. So what happens when I do bring the truth or the light of Scripture? Well, now here's two things that are occurring. Number one, you are guilty in a new way. You have experience and truths that are openly reprimanding who you are or what you do, whereas before you were fighting against or warring against a indistinguishable truth. Now it's obvious. So now the thing that once was hidden, right, now it's now it's been on, put on display before before all to see. So, but Paul says it this way. He says, "But the commandment that was ordained unto life, I found it unto death." Right? Like so, because by the commandment, sin took this advantage, and it was death unto him. So he's like, so this holy righteous thing, right? This holy righteous pure thing that was holy because I was carnal. I couldn't interact with it. Think about what I'm saying here, okay? So you interact with God. Your first interaction with God is probably negative, okay? It's probably greatly negative. The reason it being negative is because you are coming in contrast with something to who you are as a person. Paul is trying to showcase the balances that are in place when it comes to mankind. When he's talking in Romans chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, okay, he is talking about the fact that here you have, you have Abraham who accesses righteousness through faith, okay? Abraham accesses righteousness through faith. There is no written word of God. None accesses the same righteousness that we access today, even though Christ hasn't died, there hasn't been some sacrificial payment. All he knows is that he believes God. That's enough. That's plenty. Plenty. More than enough, really. Um, and it's counted unto him for righteousness. He believes God so much. He believes God so much that he is willing to sacrifice his son for God. Now, that is a faith that is deeper and richer than any faith that I see today. 
he doesn't have the knowledge that we have today. So how is it that Abraham, without the knowledge, accessed a faith that is better and richer than we have today and has more genuine encounters, even though you would have this long diatribe about how the modern Christian is embodied with the Holy Spirit of God, right? So the covenant that we have is better, the commandments that we have are better, the grace that we have is richer, the truths that we have are deeper, there's more revelation than there's ever been, and yet there's less God. You cannot have the God of Christianity without the morality of Christianity. We are great at knowing and very bad at doing. Our behavior betrays what we actually say we believe. We say a lot of things, but there's no evidence. There's no evidence. When James is saying faith without works is dead, people are so nervous about letting go of the truths that they do understand, they can't grasp the truths that they don't understand. The archetypes that you probably have encountered, let's say you've, you've encountered this, uh, this genuine archetypal pattern of faith and belief in God, okay? It's not a one-time deal. It's not a one-time deal. Escape from tyranny, not a one-time deal, Right? Um, the death of the righteous son, okay? Have you ever done right? Have you ever done the right thing and been punished for it? Not a unique thing. going to happen a lot. And what you'll notice is, who does God have die on the cross? The most righteous. Who does God ask for a sacrifice from Abraham? Does he ask for Isaac or for Ishmael? Oh, he asked for the son of promise, so he asked for the better son. Which was the better son, Abel or Cain? Okay, which one gets murdered? Which one is slaughtered? Now you say, is that a sacrifice? Is that God asking for us? No, I'm saying that the righteous are always slaughtered. This is the whole narrative that Jesus Christ is laying out to the Israelites of his age. He was saying that on you lies the blood of the prophets, and he, and he lists from Abel to Zechariah. Well, well, why? Why is that the case? The reason that that is the case is because the death of the righteous, the death of the righteous is an archetypal pattern that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that you will be punished for doing the right thing in a world that is wicked. Now, you understand that truth. There's deeper truths beyond it. If there was no unjust suffering, if there was no unjust suffering, how could God reward the just? You have no access to righteousness in an unjust world without the act of sacrifice. It's not possible. It's also why it is understood as the greatest embodiment of charity. No greater love hath any man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Now dwelleth faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these things is charity. So the greatest charitable act was the death of Christ upon the cross for all of mankind, even though, even though he was completely righteous for all of the unrighteous. This single act defeated the condemnation of death upon all mankind and gave him access to salvation. So you're going to encounter archetypal patterns again and again and again. They're going to reveal themselves as deeper and deeper truths. Those deeper truths that you do understand, that is your avenue for experience with God. Because Here's how it lays out. You encounter tribulation. Tribulation works patience. Patience works experience. And experience works hope. The reason why we live in a nihilistic, hopeless society is because people do not have experience with God. We are not fostering experiences with God because we don't understand how to experience how to encounter god right your whole pathway to encounter god is through the suffering that is in this world the suffering that is in this world is a map way for you to gain insight and understanding it said that those tribulations those tribulations this is roman chapter five they would work patience and that patience it would work experience Meaning that as I understand the suffering that I'm in, and as I bear it, as I bear the suffering that I'm in with almost as if I'm responsible for it, even though I'm not, okay? Even though I'm not, as I bear that suffering, 
I gain a powerful experience. That experience gives me unbelievable hope. You know what's true? Is that the people that have been through the most, they've been through the worst, the absolute worst. They're not only the strongest, they're also some of the most joyful, glad, happy, elated, like purpose-driven they have these rich, meaningful lives. And in contrast, there's a person who makes what it, exactly what you would want to make, um, has exactly what you'd want to have, goes exactly or wherever he wants to go or she wants to go. And that person feels empty and void. And it's simply because of this, because they have not embraced the suffering that they've encountered and they have not borne it with patience. They lack experience. And because they lack experience, they lack hope. Now, if you want a full understanding of what hope is, it's the future. Hope is the future in your Bible. That's what it is. It's, it's a cinnamon for it in, in many ways. But essentially, if there was no future, there would be no hope. So they become, they become entangled. All, there's like a truth entanglement there where you could not separate one from the other there's more suicides each year than there was the year before and it's a stark and startling contrast to the society that gets displayed and people don't understand it but yet mankind does understand suffering don't you you understand why that would happen and why that is because you've lived on this earth. You understand why people can't take it anymore if you've been alive for any amount of time. But it's a sign of hopelessness. And what's so sad is that we've reached the point where Christianity has no answer for those people. Because what it's become is also hopeless. If we cannot encounter man with God, I do not understand what purpose the church serves. And if there's anything I would like to accomplish, it would be that the church that I am at and am a part of is a place where people can regularly encounter the Lord.